The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents The Monstrous Regiment, featuring a roundtable of Dominion women seeking to honor Jesus Christ in applying God's Word fearlessly and faithfully in all callings and seasons of life, both in and out of the home, reversing the curse and smashing pagan strongholds. How should the church respond to the growing transgender community? What is the cause? Hi, I'm Liz Sachs, and this is the Monstrous Regiment. In a controversial episode of the Axe to the Root podcast, Bo Marinov drew the comparisons between patriarchy and homosexuality, showing how one is the logical conclusion of the other. In order to understand our episode better today, I'd recommend that you listen to that. It is entitled Patriarchy and Sodomy. I will argue in this episode that patriarchy and transgender culture are also related, and one inevitably flows from the other for the same reasons, and in a similar fashion. I will show how the doctrines are the same, with roots in Gnostic thinking, encouraging dualistic thought, separating our bodies from our souls. Patriarchy as we know it in the United States generally paints an idealized picture of family life. We're all familiar with it. Um, Leave it to Beaver, I Love Lucy. We envision a white woman in lipstick and heels, vacuuming as her circle skirts swish around her knees. Her pretty apron communicates a cheerful womanhood. Um, And we see her purpose in life is to exude femininity as narrowly defined by strict social constructs. So she walks, talks, sits, and behaves like a particular and very narrow ideal of womanhood. Every iota of her body perfectly curated to the feminine standard of the culture. Her dainty smile and her perfectly coiffed 50s housewife hair while she's washing dishes in a beautiful dress with a spotless apron. It's an iconic image that we hold in our cultural repository and especially enshrined in conservative culture. We have this obsession with the roles of men and the roles of women in our conservative evangelical circles um, as evidenced by uh, blogs, recorded sermons, modesty debates, and complementarian teachers like John Piper, Doug Wilson, and organizations like the Council on Biblical, Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Um, women are taught from any given pulpit um, of a conservative church. You can go in and you can hear women being taught to be submissive, men taught to be dominant. And, you know, there are uh, stereotypes such as women are emotional, men are logical. And these standards are held to be ontological and are collective in nature each person being expected to conform to their designated place in the world. And we think that this will lead to the ideal bucolic picture of the family, except it doesn't. And it excludes many of the things that make womanhood um, womanhood because they're unpleasant, difficult, uncomfortable to talk about, and they threaten this manufactured ideal with real life. In this view, externals define the man or the woman. What they wear, how they express themselves, what they eat, do, practice, master, all an outward expression of a predetermined role. External and arbitrary actions define gender. If I, for instance, do not work hard enough to wear someone's idea of feminine clothing, and if I don't try hard enough to fulfill someone's idea of my feminine role, then, as I've been told, I'm in disobedience, and even according to some, I'm on the path to hell. This is often justified using scriptures about wearing gender-specific articles of clothing. Um, Some people demand that women wear dresses and men wear pants, because that's totally what Jesus wore. Um, Thus, any departure from the cultural or subcultural standard of feminine is to be in sin. 
This translates to a self-righteous pursuit to make other women feminine like me, according to whatever extra biblical criteria someone determines to be biblical femininity. This might mean being a stay-at-home mom. It might mean certain types of dress. Um, in some plain communities, a cape dress and a, um, a cap. Um, it might mean a presentation of my body, what's covered, what's not covered. Um, it might be expressed by my fertility and my prolific reproduction. My identity as a woman may be determined by certain choices I make, like how I breastfeed, how I parent, how I respond to my husband, how I respond to the other men in my circles. And according to this thinking, these arbitrary externals determine my identity as female instead of the other way around. So this idolization of the specifically clad female body and old fashioned but extra biblical family values can actually be seen exposed by our conservative evangelical fascination with Amish culture. So we have like all these evangelical movies and books, um, Beverly Lewis comes to mind, um, movies on like pure flicks, um, where we idealize and romanticize a simpler time where men and women were defined by their roles, their clothing, and their adherence to arbitrary external markers to express their culturally defined role. This is the exact same Gnostic ideal that transgender men and women embrace when they seek to alter their physical bodies to match how they feel on the inside. Um, they believe that who they really are is at war with their biological reality. So they believe in and live the same idea um, that how I express myself physically determines my gender. The clothing I wear, the mannerisms, the activities I engage in, the bathroom I use, the collective I am part of. So transgender women engage in the same exaggerated expression of ideal femininity as the evangelical right. So it becomes all about the presentation of self, who I am and how I express my gender. Um, so like whether I achieve, if I were a transgender woman, whether I achieve transition um, to define my external expression of my chosen gender and how the world perceives me then determines my worth to myself. Trans persons live by the idea, my body is not as important as my inner self, so I will alter my body to reflect my inner self. But in both cases, evangelical conservatism and transgenderism, this view treats our bodies as suits of clothes that we manipulate to determine who we are. And it's a dualistic idea that fails to see our bodies and souls as holistic parts of ourselves. Um, ultimately, we're failing to see ourselves as created in the image of God. And it's a rejection of an essential and holistic reality that our bodies and souls are inextricably linked. They're not two separate things. They're one linked whole person. So Christians, for instance, view this principle as though our souls are ungendered and have need of an external conformity and submission in order to be truly feminine or truly masculine. Though we are admittedly inconsistent about this, the stated evangelical view being that we are naturally one way or another. So like the old canard that men are naturally visual um, or that women are more easily deceived um, or the related idea, for instance, that men are more logical while women are more emotional. So male guidance is essential to restrain women from the sin that their souls are predisposed to. Um, that is inconsistent. Um, but the pagan thinking at its root, whether expressed as a transgender principle or expressed as biblical manhood or womanhood, goes back to the garden. In both instances, it is man choosing his own law because of his lost identity. He's refused to identify himself as a creature of God created in God's image, but he's trying to redefine himself as his own God. Ultimately, transgenderism agrees with evangelical roles in every way. This is the actual flattening of the differences between the sexes as the only distinction is one that we put on and not an inherent God-given distinction. The logical extension of this point is that 
men being superior in every way would be superior women. Um, so the actual biblical idea of manhood or womanhood is at direct odds with that external standard. It acknowledges that men and women are essentially different. There's no need to force an external criteria to create femininity or masculinity because God made me feminine. Everything I do is feminine. When I make dinner, I'm feminine. When I change my oil, I'm still feminine. When I hold my baby and rock him to sleep, I'm feminine. When I use my circular saw to build a bookcase, I'm feminine. Um, when I wear pants, I'm feminine. When I lead a group of men and women to accomplish a task or to teach them a, a concept, I'm still feminine. These are not feminine, feminine or masculine activities or roles. They are feminine when I do them because I'm a woman doing them. So being a woman is fundamentally different than being a man. Physically, women may be weaker than men and more vulnerable. Our culture acknowledges this in things like self-defense classes aimed at women, admonitions to women who are shopping, like how many Facebook posts have you seen? You know, be careful when you're shopping with your children because um, carjackers might target you, human traffickers might target you because you're a woman with children. Um, one illustration of this was I remember one day um, I was a, a mission to talk about the gospel and the abolition of abortion in Seattle and um, a bunch of people were upset about us there but one man in particular there were lots of men and women um, on the street with me and so this tall threatening man he came up to me there were men around me he didn't choose them he chose me and he approached me, he was angry, he was upset. He leaned over me and I thought for sure that he would hurt me. I was newly pregnant with my son. Um, I was scared, like, is, is he gonna burn me with his cigarette? Is he gonna hit me? He was taller than me, he was bigger than me. Um, and I was terrified. And when I was like, what am I gonna do? Um, just then a man from our group saw what was happening and he placed himself uh, right behind me. And the threatening man went from like glowering over me to like pulling his shoulders back and stepping back and taking a more passive role in the interaction. Um, he may have even said to the other guy, I think he said, well, what are you going to fight me? He didn't see me as a threat, but he saw the other man as one. He knew that there was an inherent difference between how I was going to respond to him um, and how the man who saw my need was going to respond to him. And being a woman inherently impacted my experience in this interaction and how he responded to me. Um, but this is just one aspect of my femininity. And my biology is not separate from my soul. They're connected because they're both who I am. You know, they're inextricably linked. Um, I am a woman in my soul and in my body. And in sharing how I am distinctly feminine, even my bodily experience impacts my spiritual understanding. For instance, motherhood is something I've experienced. It can be a very spiritual experience. It's intertwined with your, your bodily experience as a mother, but pregnancy, breastfeeding, and motherhood, it makes women vulnerable. We often have children in our care and our bodies are either dedicated to their care directly in pregnancy or indirectly in just nurturing them and caring for them after they're out of the womb. So this changes our experience fundamentally in, in ways that we can never erase as women. Whether we're giving birth to a child or whether we're bringing one into our arms and our homes through adoption, we have a very spiritual connection to that child and in nurturing them and teaching them, we learn more about God through this experience as we're guiding and teaching our, our children. It, it often makes me think of that, that example in scripture of the, the mother hen. God is compared to a mother um, that he spreads his wings over to, to protect his children or his chicks. Um, I understand that example of God inherently because I've experienced that as a mother. Now, not every mother has this growth and realization whether they gave birth physically or cared for a child they adopted. Not every mother matures this way through that experience, but it is one example of a uniquely feminine experience that um, encompasses our bodies and our souls. Um, inherently, though, the maturity that comes through motherhood is, is 
the maturity of learning, self-sacrifice, and understanding Christ's example of service through that uniquely feminine experience. And although it's not the only way to reach an understanding of Christ's example of of self-sacrifice or that level of spiritual maturity, men can learn these same things in an inherently masculine way. Um, women who are not mothers can learn these things in another equally yet different feminine experience. But this is a distinctly feminine experience that illustrates uh, succinctly how inextricably linked our bodies and our souls are and how holistic our feminine or masculine experience really is, whether we deny it or not. Um, there are also other inherently feminine experiences, um, such as sexual vulnerability, that can further explain this point. So women are sexually receptive. We are therefore more vulnerable. We may need to depend on good men or objects such as guns to provide physical safety in the face of very real constant danger. Um, a single young lady, for instance, may find it difficult to travel in certain cultures without a protective male escort simply because of the reality of a woman's experience in those cultures. It, it's significantly impacted by their sexual vulnerability as perceived by stronger and more powerful men in that culture. Um, a news article I read um, from 2009, a young woman in Saudi Arabia was jailed and sentenced to 100 lashes for adultery after uh, being found pregnant. It turns out she had been given a ride by a man and he took him somewhere and he, or took her somewhere and he and his friends gang raped her. She became pregnant and was prosecuted for adultery despite the fact that she was raped. This is a uniquely female experience that no man can understand like a woman can understand. It affected her body and her soul. Um, but all this comes down to the point that my identity is not an external expression of femininity, but it's in who God made me to be, a female. He made me to be a woman, and that is who I am no matter what I do. <clears throat> I am a woman doing something. This is the distinction between the sexes that God has inherently created and not one that we are capable of maintaining externally by meeting some man-made standard. So there's this verse um, which is often used to justify the kind of legalism that requires women to wear skirts as a, some arbitrary external marker of femininity. <clears throat> uh, it's Deuteronomy 22 5 a woman shall not wear a man's garment nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God this verse is not a, a, about the act of putting on a specific garment it's not a wooden prescription for wearing clothing with a tag that says women's clothing in large print it's a principle um, another interpretation puts it this way. The woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man. And it's literally translated um, the gear of a warrior. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Some commentators have framed this not as a prohibition of cross-dressing, but as a prohibition of idol worship that would have involved cross-dressing. However, considering that God had already rebuked idolatry pointedly elsewhere, this verse is specifically directed towards dress. It's surrounded um, by a bunch of other short laws having to do with the principles of perpetual justice, like help your brother find his ox, do not eat two generations of wild birds at once, put a parapet around the roof of your house, or you'll be liable for damage and injury. But <clears throat> at a minimum, this passage focuses on maintaining the distinctions between the, dress, the sexes in how they dress. Um, Deuteronomy 22.5 makes the most sense, though, when it's taken against a pro, uh, as a prohibition against gender confusion. For instance, it should not be taken as a prohibition against the wearing of protective gear. So like my husband and I, we use the same safety goggles when we use the power tools. We use the same gloves when we tend to the wood stove, the same kind of helmet when we ride a bike, 
men and women who are in the situations that they need protective gear may use the same Kevlar vest to protect from bullets. Um, so to take this as a prohibition against something like wearing protective gear would be to put this provision above the Sixth Commandment. Um, the Westminster Short Catechism, question 68, says, <coughs> The Sixth Commandment requires all lawful endeavors to preserve our own life and the life of others. So it's not a wooden idea that um, men and women can't wear the same type of garments. Um, and the commandment can't prohibit women ever wearing items of clothing that may have been touched or used by a man. For instance, in the West, pants are considered a male article of clothing. In the East, pants are considered very feminine. While skirts are traditional masculine attire in uh, Scotland, and flowing robes were worn by Jesus and the Old Testament patriarchs. So the commandment rather exhorts us to take care to cultivate differences between the sexes and in how we dress as a means to generally preserving the differences between the sexes. So inherent in this provision is a desire to conserve the difference between masculinity and femininity. <clears throat> the indication that the gear of the warrior illustrates a particular blurring of the line because as we'd expect at the time, men were generally supposed to go and war in place of women. Um, <clears throat> this is further supported in light of Mark 7.15 where Jesus says, there's nothing outside of the person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. This indicates that, you know, God looks on the outward, or sorry, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. It's about the intention of the heart, not the structure or appearance of the garment itself. It's about a distinction between the sexes. Um not a, a legalistic man-made standard of which garment should be on which. So someone insisting <clears throat> that biblical womanhood requires skirts for women as an external standard is just as pagan as the transgender doctrine that what we present externally changes who you are. And they're both practically rejecting Christ's words in Mark 7.15 in exactly the same way. So Nancy Piercy makes the point in her book, Love Thy Body, that transgender ideology devalues the body in favor of the spirit, um, saying that the way that you feel on the inside is more important than the totality of you, body and soul. But your body is part of who you are, but transgender roles require denying your body and denying others' bodies. So then many Christians who would say that you're insufficiently feminine unless you're wearing skirts or insufficiently masculine unless you're wearing denim and flannel, are also devaluing the body in the exact same way. It follows that since the body and the spirit are in union holistically, that devaluing the body also devalues the soul. This Gnosticism can be distilled down to this. Externals are what make you male or female. It doesn't matter who's saying it, the transgender ideologue or an evangelical Christian. This same idea allows for those extra biblical legalistic standards that are imposed as burdens onto women and men from a fundamentalist standpoint. Just as much as it allows for men to appropriate and imitate womanhood in a devaluation and trivialization of what womanhood truly is. The similarities are not coincidental. Transsexual ideals are the ultimate conclusion of patriarchy, where the best women are actually men, and conversely, the most desirable thing for a woman to be is a man. Men who enjoy male privilege can play at being women and even times be the best women without experiencing any of the struggle, sacrifice, fear, vulnerability of womanhood. Uh, one example um, is Caitlyn Jenner being named Woman of the Year. Transgender women can appropriate our experiences like visiting a theme park and then abandon that in favor of their own privilege and power 
when it gets difficult. Um, we see this in sports as they take our titles, they best our categories, and in the wider culture also in a similar fashion, they continue to objectify women's bodies. They trivialize our experiences um, in this pale mimicry of womanhood, um, tinting pads to pretend to have their period, taking medication to induce breastfeeding, um, and furthering the view of women as sex objects by presenting themselves as superior sex objects. So this communicates that men are better at being women than women are, and that women and children are actually for the purpose of men's gratification and personal fulfillment. We're objects to provide experiences for the sake of men's longings. Um, In the culture at large, another way that we see this is uh, spaces meant to be safe havens are now subject to the demands of male bodies for access. So rape shelters, domestic violence shelters, bathrooms, locker rooms, these are just some examples of where women are no longer able to have safe havens where they do not have to encounter the danger of rape or assault, or where women who are recovering from rape or assault are forced to give way to male entitlement and have no choice but to exist in vulnerable spaces with no protection against stronger male bodies. One story in Toronto, there was this one man, um, Christopher Hambrook, who took advantage of this at a women's shelter and several women were made his victims. This is a direct result of lost people using the tools they have available to enact what they believe will solve their problems. So they appeal to the state and their, in their humanistic thinking, they appeal to the state as a means to enforce what they consider to be right and good. Um, an example of how the transgender rights movement has done this in my own area, uh, Boyertown High School appealed to the Supreme Court um, because uh, transgender rights, the transgender rights movement here um, insisted the state enforce the integration of trans persons into um, the public school facilities, locker rooms and bathrooms. Um, So we often wrongly view this as a problem that is caused by transgender rights, but it's really a much bigger issue. When we have the state decide where boys and girls are going to go to the bathroom and shower to begin with, then the existing problems with the model of the state determining these things are only highlighted and exposed when you bring transgender students into the mix. If education were a free market enterprise where people could choose schools based on shared values and priorities, then everyone could put their children where they feel safest and most comfortable instead of being at the mercy of the federal government win. So, um, or in the case of women's prisons, also uh, transgender rights of appealing to the state, it adds another layer of sexual abuse and vulnerability to an already abusive and unjust system where the state determines who is and is not criminal, places them under the power of corrupt agents who rape them and um, abuse them, and then they're enslaved and abused in our criminal injustice system, but just one more way. Um, So we can't lay the blame of that particular pagan thinking at the feet of transgender rights. We have to lay it at our own desire to have the state control what is not in its purview. Our own pagan thinking caused this, and the lost are using the resources at their disposal to establish what is right in their own eyes. We should not be surprised at that, but we know better. And yet women and children are still the most vulnerable and the most harmed in this state enforced system. So this is how transgender ideology is just another application of power religion in a patriarchal expression where children and women are both being sacrificed on the altar of male desire and male privilege. It's not another form of such demands. It's an extension of them. This is patriarchy realized in its fullest form. In all of these contexts, in an evangelical context, we have men having to prove that they're men. And we have women having to prove that they don't mind not being as good as men so that they can be considered properly feminine. And then in a transgender context, we have men having to prove that they're better women and women having to prove that they're at least as good as men or are men. But it's always men that are the measuring stick. This deprives women of our basic rights, our sense of worth, our ability to retain any sort of unique female sisterhood when all these distinctions are flattened 
And there's really no such thing as any womanhood given to us by our creator. This is also a foundational component of abortion on demand. The belief that women must be identical to men in order to be as valuable as men. And so to achieve that, women must be entitled to oppress those weaker than ourselves, just as men are. The same pagan foundation for identity is feeding all of these views. The evangelical view is based on John Knox's ideas written out in the blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women, um, which we discussed in the first episode of this podcast. The specific belief that I'm referring to being Knox's claim that women are the lesser image of God in men. Um, Children are also included in this man-centric belief, not surprisingly. Um, Some versions of it even purport that women are not created in God's image at all, but lesser image bearers reflecting the image of man. Um, This is justified by the verse that calls women the glory of the man. Um, But ultimately, this props up the implied and sometimes even explicit beliefs about women's lesser worth that are applied in evangelical expressions of patriarchy. The verse about the women being the glory of the man, however, actually means the opposite. Women are indeed the glory of mankind, our vulnerability and our femininity, a helpmeet to humanity. And without our unique expression of the image of God in us, mankind's kingdom work would be incomplete. So in this way, the biblical view of men and women rejects any flattening of the sexes and cherishes the unique, holistic body and soul expression of Imago Dei that each of us in our own masculine and feminine forms of God's image in mankind are the very physical and spiritual way in which we complete one another. So the rejection of Imago Dei in any context fractures any true understanding of human identity or dignity. This creates a plethora of ways that we can dehumanize and oppress one another. But anytime that we reject God's word, abuse will follow, um, whether it is the abuse of ourselves or the abuse of others. The only thing separating the pagan foundations of evangelical thinking and transgender culture is tribal affiliation and competition for moral superiority. Both sides look at each other with utter hatred and are disgusted at the other's shared values. So um, I've seen posts in evangelical groups on Facebook along the lines of, how do we take a stand against LGBTQ stuff? Or we're just fighting for our religious rights. So there's this us versus them tribalism that stinks of children in the schoolyard and they're like all shouting with smirks on their faces. Ew, I can't go near her. She has cooties. Or they're posting signs like boys aren't allowed Um, on their clubhouse doors. Um, Even more reflected is the safe space mentality where we've got like these tidy church ladies who are gasping and clutching their pearls over the thought of seeing those couples in the grocery store at the park or on a carnival ride. You know, they're sitting there and going, I mean, I know they exist, but why do they have to be in my space? Then, you know, we've got the shaking anger and the mocking glee. When we see crude names that are used to refer to the other, we have this idea that our enemies are bad and they're not as good as we are. So we have these gotcha moments and we think that those in hatred are better than love and understanding. After all, compassion never scored points for my team. This is our attitude. This is our pagan reaction. However, those same opinions abound on the other team and in surprisingly similar forms. We have outspoken Christians who are expelled from safe spaces, business owners who won't serve those kind, and there's equally as much pearl clutching and angry proclamations of moral superiority from the more progressive side of the debate. Destruction is too good for them. Let's obliterate anyone who dares to disagree. Dehumanizing and belittling other people who aren't as enlightened or as righteous as I am is totally the order of the day. And so the alienation of both sides continues while the screams reach a fever pitch. These similar reactions are still flowing from the same foundation. 
The only difference is that one is realized in a slightly different context than the other. So both prioritize these external rules and a humanistic viewpoint. Both are rejecting foundational biblical doctrine and both are ending in the abuse of image bearers. Both believe that peace can be found in the flesh, either in altering the flesh or achieving some kind of external ideal of it. They, you know, trans persons, assume that we're choosing to prosecute them, persecute them solely to justify our own self-righteousness. And in some cases, I do think we would do well to consider this point because our loud disgust at the thought of trans persons often sounds much like self-righteous attempts to distance ourselves from what we consider dangerous and sinful, as if we actually will be tainted by any contact with the especially heinous section of the lost, as if there's some test somewhere and we're only going to pass by condemning the particularly terrible sinners, like we have some kind of sexual red scare in the Sunday school class. So we all have to point at them and say, no, 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 we don't want any part of them. Um, But we often unwittingly assume, I think, that they choose to suffer depression, confusion, and a lack of peace simply because they're coming after us. Um, Some of us, in expressing our ideal world, sound eerily similar to the closing scenes of Beauty and the Beast, where we've got the angry townsmen seeking to destroy the monster with their pitchforks and torches. But we're still all ending up as different flavors of the same team. Let's listen to what God has to say. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Don't you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? This is written to us. There we are, Christians. We're jeering and we're judging others while we do the exact same things in our own hearts. We know those who do not know God will stand firmly on whatever they deem to be right in their own eyes. This is not a surprise. But it's especially egregious that rather than know us by our love, the world knows us by our strict adherence to the party line and our desperate attempts to maintain an external man-made purity in our little Christian ghettos at the cost of furthering the gospel and at the cost of broken hurt souls. If we claim to have, and indeed do have, the spirit of God, then why are we embracing pagan thinking when it comes to how we teach and judge one another? What we think on this subject impacts the weakest among us, placing burdens on little ones that some of us will not lift a finger to bear. They use this ideology to abuse their own bodies. We use it to justify abusing others. What can we fear in reaching out and loving those who need the power of the gospel? We know what is good and right and true, and yet we resort to the exact same tactics, foundation, and actions as the other tribe. Tearing down, destroying those we hate, instead of standing firmly on the truth of God's word and fearlessly advancing his kingdom while showing the lost and the needy who he is. It's not us, but it is Christ in us who can accomplish these things. We can trust him to work above and beyond what we can ask or think. I cannot stress enough that what Christ himself calls foundational is the first principle of God's law that we should apply here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Rooted in the foundational doctrine of Imago Dei, we can begin to untangle all the threads of culture and explore what God actually says in light of these important laws. Human beings have value and dignity. God does not abrogate his, his image in humans simply because they aren't good enough or because they engage in sins that we find especially heinous. If that were the case, then none of us would be worthy of the gospel. In fact, that is the very point of the gospel. For such were some of you, as Corinthians 16, 11 says. We cannot cherish idolatry 
while pointing fingers at others' idolatry, especially when it is the very same idol that we are bowing down to. We need to take down our idols first. We need to realize that it's not how we express ourselves or speak or what community we identify with that make us redeemed. We can't engage in a gospel of works, assuming that a, a skirt will save me and my male, male neighbors from the inherent sin of my femininity. For it is the same gospel as that which assumes that a skirt will redeem a woman or pants will redeem a man from our inherent sin natures. Looking to Christ does not require church attire. Our idols will always separate us from the truth. Our attempts to share the gospel and to call the, the culture to repentance are lost in the noise and undermined by our own indulging of idolatry, the same exact kind in which the other tribe indulges. This hypocrisy blasphemes the gospel and is the very reason that the world claims moral superiority with very little effort. We have ourselves elevated it to the place of an idol. And we're going to go back to Romans 2 for a second. It describes this very situation. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Looking at our transgender neighbors with compassion enables us to see before us broken men and women who are in need. In need of love, compassion, gospel truth, and not trite, I'll pray for you, statements that are subtly, subtly communicating our condescension to them. We need to set aside our idols and recognize the truth of God's word in our own lives. We need to take the posture of the redeemed, not the high-handed purveyors of piety. We should not look down at the unredeemed as those blasted heathens who are ruining everything, but as image bearers in need of their creator. And we especially cannot boast of how we were spit on and hated and we heard people blaspheme God when we went to those parades and pointed our fingers at those who needed the gospel while we were engaging in the same pagan ideas. When we hold signs that say things like, women belong in the kitchen, we are exactly what Paul is speaking of when he says, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. When we say things like, your husband owns your body to a woman who is going into an abortion clinic. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of us. We are just as pagan as they are. And our angry, hateful jabs at them that elicit angry, hateful responses are not a badge of honor, but rather a tragic blasphemy of the gospel in the name of self-righteousness where we engage in offense in order to offend. There are God-honoring ways to tell other image bearers about the redemption we can find in Christ. There is no need to call people whores or scream at them that they're, not being, they're going to hell for not being stay-at-home moms or that they deserve to be raped for wearing yoga pants. And these are not straw men. I have heard professing Christians say these things while they are giving the gospel to the lost. That is not the gospel, but another gospel. Christ died for men and women who are broken, sinful, and not worthy. We can't know who is and is not redeemed, who will and will not be redeemed. We can know that every human standing in front of us is an image bearer, a neighbor, loving God, 
begins in that case with loving them. It does not mean that we charge them with loud yells of repent from your wickedness from across the picket line just so we can feel good about our own prideful self-righteousness. This is not to say that we cannot call sin what it is and that we cannot tell people that repentance is the first step. We can do that. We just don't need to do it in order to justify our own self-righteous pride. In the holistic view of our bodies and souls, we must recognize our bodies as part of ourselves so we can rightly recognize the very real struggle and pain that comes with body dysmorphic disorder. And we can seek to minister to those who are suffering with this very real and difficult mental health condition. The secular world looks at it, they see only the body, treating it as a suit of clothing that can be changed and an illness to be cured. Whereas Christians, we see only the soul and we seek to transform people with platitudes and prayers and we tell transgender persons to be warm, be filled, and be on their way, just so long as they wear the right clothing when we're looking. We know that both are harmful, denying the needs of the soul and denying the needs of the body. We take part in the same error as secular healthcare where they deny the soul and we are building on the same dualist Gnostic foundation from a different angle when we deny the needs of the body. We have forgotten an inherently Christian principle in emphasizing dualistic pro- approaches like nuthetic counseling aimed purely at the soul and denying or glossing over psychological illnesses, afflictions, and injuries, whether they're caused by abuse or physical problems. Where are the Christians with the evidence-based medical help? If we're post-millennialist, why aren't we seeking to make the world a better place and taking dominion even over mental health needs and seeking to treat them as they are, afflictions of bodies and souls? Where are the Christians pioneering with compassionate medical care, seeing human beings as in need of dignity and holistic care? Are we seeking the ways to address imbalances in the body which may affect or result from pain in the soul? Even if we do think of this in a biblical fashion and consider LGBTQ proponents as image bearers who have value as God's creation, speak the truth in love, and seek to live the full orb gospel in the world that embraces pagan ideas and traditions, are we using scripture to make them our enemies? Are we speaking of them in disgust and hatred with mocking? Are we belittling them? Are we taking every opportunity to tell them how vile they are in our eyes because they're not as righteous and as clean as we are? How did Jesus confront people in open sin? Let's consider the woman at the well whom he gently confronted. He didn't hold back an ounce of truth, but he allowed her conscience to do the talking for him. He had every reason culturally to treat her as dirty and lesser like many of us speak to members of the LGBTQ movement today, and yet he treated her with compassion and dignity, which was unfortunately a new sensation for her. Consider how disarming his law to the proud, grace to the humble approach was, and how it can be to those who are already bracing themselves for harsh retribution because their consciences are already bearing witness to what we and they know to be true about sexual sin. One scripture I've heard used to justify all manner of speech about LGBTQ proponents is Romans 1. Therefore God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. This passage is not a blank check for us to spit in disgust on other image bearers. Rather, it's a description of the downward fall into the tragic rejection of God. We cannot know who is beyond the truth or why. What we can do is obey the Great Commission, teaching every creature whatsoever Christ commanded. And Christ himself modeled for us a service-based ministry that disarmed the haters, convicted the sinners, and rebuked the self-righteous. Repentance is hard. Healing is messy and understanding the holistic nature of each person is complex. Justification is the beginning of a long and individual journey of maturity through sanctification. We cannot demand overnight outward conformity so we can call them healed, claim an easy victory at the expense of a broken soul. It takes a lot of pain to come to the place of deluding ourselves that we are 
what we are not, denying God's intent and purpose for us. Can we not compassionately consider that many trans people are actually trying to make sense of what really does feel like their real selves with the little twisted pagan philosophy and tools that they have available to them? I mean, this is what is meant by the lost. Every choice they make to deny God's purpose in their life, it it hurts themselves and it destroys their bodies and souls. They're not out to get us. They're groping in the dark without light, which we have. Our proper response to a culture that is continually rejecting God is to show in our lives and our actions who God is and what he does, to be that salt and light. By taking dominion of art, culture, medicine, manufacturing, services, entertainment, etc., we can do it and do it better according to God's ethics, judging all things correctly, being salt and light in everything we say and do. We need to stop retreating in disgust and start taking dominion fearlessly. We need to be unafraid to meet that gay couple in the store, that transgender woman in the parking lot, seeing them buying houses on TV. It's not they in their presence that we need to fear. Rather, we meet it head on in the spirit of love and a sound mind. This is what God has given us. We can teach our children truth and compassion by example. We don't need to cover their eyes and hide them from the lost and needy in our communities. We can model grace and truthfulness instead of seeking personal freedom from participation just as long as our hands aren't sullied by the culture around us. We need to remember what Christ said to the lost and take his posture when it comes to us being in contact with them. He said, my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Come and find rest. A while ago, a friend in the service industry where she may find herself assisting gay couples and building families asked me, um, assisting the gay couples, not assisting them building their families, just assisting them while they're building their families. So she asked me, Liz, what should I do if a gay couple asks for my services? And I told her, give them. And while you do, speak truth. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of their presence. Be bold and willing to speak openly about why you do what you do, who you're doing it for. They're going to either accept that graciously and hear the truth or they're going to fire you. In which case, you haven't compromised anything. You will have been salt and light. You will have been an example of Christ in their lives. You will have come alongside them with the truth. We have nothing to fear in facing the transgender men and women in our culture. We are not going to catch LGBTQ sin from them. It's not a disease. There is no reason to be hateful and make them our enemies because of how we act around them. Rather, in love and a sound mind, we serve them boldly and fearlessly, being that walking witness to truth in their lives. Unafraid as Jesus was when he sat down and asked a Samaritan woman for water and said to her, I am living water. Come to me and be satisfied. Thank you for listening to The Monstrous Regiment. We hope this podcast inspires and equips you to go and exercise dominion for Christ's kingdom. Terrible as an army with banners. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator 
or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.